Welcome to our Wednesday night shiur on the book of Shmuel. Today we will be reviewing chapter two. Thank you. All right, so we left off on an interesting note, how um, Hannah got what she wanted. She got Shmuel and just a couple of corrections I want to make from last week that I said. Uh, last week I said that Hannah, uh, sorry, Penina lost all 10 of her children. That's not the case. She ended up losing eight out of the 10. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other correction is, according to the commentator, I forgot, Radak, I believe, or I forgot who it was, that Shmuel was not three years old when he came to Eli. He was two. That's the average age it takes to... Um, amen. Average age it takes to wean somebody, to wean a child. Nice. Nice. Yeah, All right, so we're just going to jump into the text now. Yeah. Now we're actually going to get into Hannah's song of prayer. Uh, it's her famous uh, song, which is also, it, it, it's it's like a pro prophecy song, and it's also a prayer. Is there a song to it also? I don't know. But Then Hannah, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in Hashem. My pride has been raised through Hashem. My mouth is open wide against my antagonists, for I rejoice in your salvation. So as we learned last week, she was talking to her heart in order to uh, cleanse it out from any alter ulterior motive to have a child. And now that it's completely connected to Hashem, she continues to basically praise God and and identify the source of her success. Oh. It's like that joke. Or you guys remember that joke with the guy in Tel Aviv looking for parking? Never mind. <laughs> exactly. So sometimes we're we're looking for we're asking for something, and then when we get it, we forget why we got it in the first place. So she definitely does not forget. Not only that, she actually teaches us on how to respond to success and also how to pray in general. There is none as holy as Hashem, for there is none besides you, and there is no rock like our God. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why she compares God to rock, uh, there it's it's not she's I believe not the first one that can compares mm -hmm. God to to a rock. It's a common theme. A common mm -hmm. theme uh, mm -hmm. in in Kabbalah, there is an interesting idea that God withdraws Himself from the world, mm -hmm. and the more He withdraws Himself, the more alive the world becomes. Mm -hmm. And we have four levels of life. So we have uh, Tomea, mm -hmm. then we have uh, uh, Dome, then we have Chai, and then we have Medabet. Sorry, Domem, Tomea, Chai, Medabet. So we start with Domem, which is like ina inanimate objects like oh, a rock. Tomea, wow. then we have something like really? plant life. Then we have Chai, which is an animal, and Medabet like a human being. So the progression through each level is that their ability to express their life in this physical world. So an animate object seems like it's lacking any life force, but the reality is everything has life force of its god godly life force. So we don't see how a rock behaves because in the grand scheme of things, in our limited time spent on earth, we don't see it's their movements, but even mountains move and rocks change over time. Uh, so they are, to an extent, animated. So the reason why we compare God to a rock, one of the reasons, is because rock is furthest removed from this world, which would make it closest to godliness. That's where the tzimtzum has not fully formed. So if you think about tzimtzum, the more, the higher grade of the tzimtzum, then it, it, it degrades 
from uh, from rock. It's actually degradation to a plant, degradation to an animal, and degradation to a human. Because the more further you removed you are from God, the more you can do things contrary to God's will. So the rock is bound to God. In, in essence it's it's almost not eternal but it spans through millennia and 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 billions of years some rocks yeah. just like god is beyond time so that that's kind a kind of constant that's why a more constant and right don't take rock that that's just what that's just one idea and don't take rock for granted don't take rock for granted. <laughs> another reason why we have uh comparison to the rock is from the talmud as it reads there uh actually Actually, you can read sur as sayar, not rock, but artisan. So God shaped. So instead of saying, instead of reading it, that there is no rock like our God, there is no artisan like God. Because she's basically saying that God was able to form Shmuel in, in a most perfect way. And uh, we will continue here. Do not abound in speaking with arrogance upon arrogance. Uh, Gimel. Al tarbu tedabru gevoha gevoha etza atak mi vechem kiel deot adonai velonit kenu alilot. So, essentially, if if you're faced with arrogance, like uh, somebody challenging you, do not respond back with it. Oh. Because haughtiness will come from your, from your mouth. When you're trying to defend yourself, you always have to, people end up elevating themselves. And haughtiness, it removes a person from God. So if we're faced with any challenge, we're supposed to accept that it's coming from God. Mm -hmm. Like even, uh, I remember in Garden of Amuna, mm -hmm. uh, it says if a police officer stops you or you go into, into court in front of a judge, don't think that this judge or police officer is interacting with you. Think that you're facing Dean from heaven, and it's being man it's manifesting through this physical uh, channel. So if somebody is being arrogant towards you and, and and giving you a rebuke or whatever it may be, the response should not be uh, the, the, like fighting back. Sometimes it's important to realize that uh, their their treatment of you, is something there's no there's no tribulation without transgression mm -hmm. it's a well deserved even though that person might might be wrong and they will get also um, judged for what they're doing they're essentially being an executioner of uh of a bad judgment but nevertheless we're supposed to see where the judgment's coming from where it's originating it's the other per it's, 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 it's dean the other person person is just a vehicle so if you don't mm -hmm. respond to it then you walk away from the deen and you walk on the side of Rahmanud. You will go from the left side of the spirituality to the right side. And if you stay on the left, what's going to happen? You're going to inflate into haughtiness and removing yourself from God. So for Hashem is God of thoughts. That's a really nice pasuk. I love that one. And, and, and men's deeds are accounted by him. If you remember from last week, we were talking about at Sadat, and how knowledge in general, svirat of da'at, is cannot coexist with keter, and keter symbolizes will of God, and da'at symbolizes a function on a more automated level. Here, what Hana is implying, and, and we also explored the idea that Hana was doing a tikkun for a tzadat, and Hana was purifying herself, and now she's saying that now that she is purified, and she sees that uh, as Sadat can be per permissible as long as you t take out any evil, and evil is anything that is antithesis of Hashem, then even thoughts and knowledge can be completely unified with God. And look at the pasuk here. El deot Adonai velo nitkenolilot. So it's a very interesting concept. Okay. So usually man's thoughts or man's knowledge uh, allows them to kind of function independently from God. But if you fill your mind with godliness, and if you realize that all your thoughts are actually coming from the holy domain of Chachmain Bina, from the upper domains, not from your own intelligence, then you're essentially becoming a conduit of God's will. You're exercising God's will, and and, and it does not um, does not block out the channel of Keter. And here's another interesting idea here that's, that's very cool. We have 
generation upon generation that kind of went through all the Sefirot, right? Mm -hmm. We have Avram Itzak Yaakov, Chesed, uh, Gvura Tiferet. Mm -hmm. Then we had Netzachot, which is Moshe Aaron. Mm -hmm. We had Yisod, which is uh, Yosef, and Malchut, which is David. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it slightly out of order, oh. chronologically, right? It's supposed to be uh, uh, Moshe Aaron, then should have been Yosef, and then should have been David. Mm -hmm. So Yosef came before Moshe and Aaron, and, and it, it it's a very interesting thing here that happened. So things got flipped a little bit. The progression didn't lead to Malchut as it should have upon entering the land of Israel, as we discussed before. So what is Hannah trying to do? She's trying to restore the order, which in once you enter the land of Israel, Malchut will, uh, will shine. So Yosef got stuck doing his work in Egypt. So you need a replacement for him. Moshe Aaron also did not enter the land of Israel. You need a replacement for them as well. So now let's think a little bit. Where did uh, Shmuel come from? From which tribe of Levi? And but he was inside the land of Ephraim. And Ephraim is descendant of Yosef. So was he a coin? Who? He was not a coin. Only Levi, only? He was only Levi. Oh. Yeah. So he's coming from, from the land. And in fact, El Elkanah is sometimes called like, uh, uh, what's that word? S somebody from, from Ephraim. Oh, and there is a debate whether he is Ephraim or he's a Levi. But in fact, he's a Levi. Yeah. But he's coming from Ephraim. And, and Shmuel himself, he, he is compared to Moshe and Aaron. So yeah. he is compared to Netzach and Chod. And he is coming from Yisod. Mm -hmm. And what does he bring? He brings Malchut, which is David the Yeah. So that inside land of Israel, all those channels get restored. And it's oh, continuation. Oh. Boom. M M Shmuel is compared to whom? Moshe, Moshe and Aaron. To two. Oh, Netzach and Chod. Where is he coming from? From the his origin is established here from the land of Ephraim, mm -hmm. which is lineage of, of Yosef. Alternatively, you can also say that uh, Yosef is from Rachel, right? Mm -hmm. Who did he proclaim the first king? It was Shaul. Yeah. Shaul is from Benjamin, also from Rachel. Yeah. So that's another connection you can make. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah. it all leads down to David, which is Malchut. Yeah. So you do all of this interesting spiritual... It's different lineage. It, the, the, don't think about the lineage. Think about the spiritual concentration. Mm -hmm. Purification of all the spirot in order for David to receive all of the energy that was gleaned from... He, he gets everything. And ultimately, what, what is his job? His job is to create a kingdom where God's will is permeating throughout the nation. Yeah. It's obvious to everybody that God exists yeah. and God's will is supreme. So what does he do? He takes Malchut, which is furthest removed from Keter, and actually flips it, it upside together. down and, and channels it together. And we discussed this many times before, that Malchut and Keter can merge together and it yeah. becomes like a wormhole. Wow. Isn't Malchut is the two, opposite? two opposite extremes. But what happens if you fold the paper? They, they meet them together. They meet together. Yeah. So Malchut has the power to unite with Keter, even though on the opposite extremes, but they, they have the power. If you purify the whole path in who's, between who's Keter and... Saying... What? Who, who's doing the, the Malchut and the... Beginning. Well, it's the, all of the people that <laughs> came before, they helped channel the energy through Yisod into David, and then he did he did the final purification. He created a kingdom where everything was absolutely perfect, and God's will good exercise. Okay. And that's what Mashiach essentially is going to do. There will be also a Mashiach ben Yosef that will channel the energy. Kingdom the kingdom with David. There was a kingdom with David. That's what I'm saying. And the comment was, that, that was that that's that's what that's why we need a king. That's why there is a commandment to have a king to establish in, in the world. And, and that's why uh, as well to restore that kingship to restore restore Malchut in the world it's it's essentially connected to also Shabbat Shabbat is very similar in in, in its essence we have uh, the three spirot on the right three spirot on the left and then Malchut comes at the end 
So there is a command to to have a melech, but it seems there is. Uh, we we looked at it last time. It's no, there is instruction. No, there is actual commandment. If you want, I show it to you. All right. So now let's let's continue. Get back to the text here. So I think now we understand the importance of having a king because we have to have a king will a, a king a monarch can unify the people and and a king can establish a, a place where god's will will reign supreme essentially what king david did and why he's so exemplary even his own wife michal did not understand it at the time again i'm jumping ahead but what happened when they the ark was brought back he was dancing like a common person and michal said it's not like you, you're not you're not honoring your kingship by dancing like a common person and said but you don't realize right now the king of kings is it's obvious that he exists so i am like a common person so if a jewish king if a jewish king essentially uh takes all of his power and dedicates it back to god and shows that god is the ultimate king then that's that's the purpose then he he binds the sphere of of Malchut to, to Spirov Ketzer. And you go from one extreme to the other. Uh, the bow of the mighty is broken. Number four. Keshet giborib chatim v'nikshalim azru chayim. The bow of the mighty is broken while the foundering are girded with strength. Uh, she's actually referring to what's going to be happening in the future with Hanukkah. That uh, the mighty Greeks... Their God broke their bow. Actually, the whole the whole uh, song or prayer is all prophetic here. So she's referring to how Greeks will will be uh, um, conquered by a, a much smaller army. Yeah. Then number five, Keshet. Oh, we just read that. Uh, the sated ones I, are hired out of bread while the hungry ones uh, cease to be so while the barren woman bears seven the one with many children becomes bereft so the second part of that while the barren she's referring to herself or anybody that's barren like also uh, so by the way she it, she had five children uh not seven mm -hmm. so why would it say seven because if you take the gematria of uh, shmuel it it is 377 mm -hmm. is the same of uh, as the number shiva seven so he is compared to seven and it's oftentimes um it, it, it's a biblical form of idiom anytime you say seven it means many so that's a nice little note here in general, we're going to see here throughout her prayer how people's fate can change uh, instantly. Like, never think that you're stuck in a certain situation. God can redeem you from any place. And and likely and and likewise, if a person sitting on top, don't get too comfortable because your your um, situation can get reversed as well. Mm -hmm. That's why King Solomon, when he asked for something to help him overcome emotions. Uh, they gave him a ring. I forgot who it was. His teacher, I think, he made him a ring. Said, "This too shall pass." So don't don't think that your bad times are gonna stick around. It, they will pass, and also the good times can pass as well. So be be ready for change. Uh, and, and but all, always realize that God exacts judgment perfectly, even though that we don't always see the truth behind the curtains. Uh, we're blinded by our own life and our own situation, but God is perfect in his ways. Number six. Hashem brings death and gives life. He lowers to the grave and rises up. Mm -hmm. This pasuk referring to Korah. Why is it referring to Korah? Because Shmuel descended from Korah. And what happened to Korah? Korah was thinking... He saw prophetically that he is going to be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron combined. So he challenges them both. He says, I'm greater than both of you. But what he didn't realize, it wasn't him. It was his descendant that's going to be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. It's similar to the situation with Potiphar's wife. She also saw astrologically that something is going to be great from her relationship with Yosef, but what she didn't realize it wasn't actually her, 
it was her daughter so, that so needed what, to unite with what, what with you also. What? How did these people have such prophecy? You know, she was Potiphar's wife. You know, Potiphar's wife was doing astrology, and uh, oftentimes back in the day, people would look in the sky, try to seeing their fate. And uh, she saw they were very spiritual people, not necessarily prophets, but they could foretell certain things about their destiny. He raises the needy from the dirt, from the trash heaps, he lives the destitute, the, to seed them with nobles and to endow them with the seat of honor for Hashem's are the pillars of the earth and upon them he said the world what is she referring to how many prophets can be in a remez? All remez in here. It's, it's cool. actually one of the commentators i think from the gemara said that this can be uh compared to to amida there, there, yeah actually it wasn't gemara i'll find the commentary here the this whole thing oh, is compared it was i believe they, they mean they're, they, this is the role model for bringing it to the shmoy that's right they're using this it, it's yeah this is like uh, uh the first form of shman this is the, model the first it. model yes praising god praising god praising god yeah, yeah. and then eventually it gets to actually okay, asking yeah. for something to request and that's how we should pray in general we should never just go out to god and say i need this i need that it should start off with uh, please uh, uh, thank you for everything that you've given me you appreciate more than more than what, what does that accomplish if a person does not appreciate his current situation and he's saying you have misjudged me oh, I deserve oh, this please give me that you're immediately channeling yourself to the <clears throat> side of God's way of interacting with the world which is through Dean through judgment mm -hmm. you're saying I need this means I deserve it right Hashem says, okay, let's see what you deserve. Checks. Okay. Actually, you don't deserve any of the things that you had before. Instead of giving, I'm going to remove. You wanted me to be the judge. I'll be the judge, so I'm going to remove. In, in this particular case, she's doing exact opposite. She's telling God, thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for doing that. She's acknowledging God's mercy. And then she's asking, okay, give me a little bit more. And that's how we should pray in general. So now we're getting closer to her actual, her actual request. Number nine. He guards the steps of, of his devout ones, but the wicked are still in darkness. For not through strength does men prevail. So this one is, if Talmud tells us the word raglei is... Uh, translate as occasions in plural and it actually teaches a very 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 valuable lesson if a person is challenged two times so the reason why it's in plural to indicate that if you have a challenge twice at least twice for a temptation and you overcome the temptation god will come to your rescue the third time so that's something to keep in mind sometimes we get discouraged like we had some kind of and we overcame it barely and then it comes again oh, I, I can't do it again but just think if you can overcome it for the second time Here third time you will have it. divine but, assistance but why actually have this test if you oh, if you if you succeed the test why the test will keep coming again it's it, it, it sometimes <laughs> reinforces through redundancy if you if you got lucky one time and second time you truly putting your effort Higher level. It's it's reinforcing. Just like we have two pair of eyes. It's uh, like two witnesses that serve your two deeds that are protecting you. When you have two deeds, first deed was overcoming the first temptation. Second yeah. deed was over overcoming second temptation. <clears throat> serve as witnesses for you in front of Hakadosh Baruch Hu in order to get you through the next time, third time. So that, keep that in mind. If you are faced with the same exact challenge twice and you overcome it god willing the third time it's going to get easier all right let's continue number 10 this now it's getting more and more exciting 
Адунай хату мерива алав башамай ми арем адунай один авсе арет пайтен озла малко верем кредно шеко. Аше мей дос ху контент with them be shattered. Let the heavens thunder against them. May Hashem judge to the ends of the earth. May he give power to his king and raise the pride of his anointed one. This one is jam-packed. Let's actually go backwards here. Uh, and you will see that this is a prophecy. So she is already predicting that he is going to be anointing a king. He's only two years old. How would she know that he's going to be anointing a king? The prophetess, exactly. Not only that, look at the language here. After exper expressing praise and gratitude to, to God, now Hannah is actually asking for requests for her son. And uh, Shmuel anointed Shaul and David, and Hannah prayed for their success. She's not only praying for her son, but she's praying for the kings that she, she is going to appoint to succeed. And, and oftentimes, um, any success that we get is coming from, from the mother. The amount of time the mother is praying for her children is unbelievable. It follows, follows them throughout their lifetime. So you can attribute most of the success that Shmuel had to potentially. Yeah. That's how, how, much, how much do we have to honor our mothers? So now the story goes back to Elkanah, and we have only a few more minutes left. I'll go to the speaker. This gets very interesting. I'm going to skip Hebrew and just go in. Elkanah then went to Ramah to his house while the boys served at him before Eli the coin. The son of Eli were lawless men. They did not recognize Hashem. So Eli had two sons, uh, Pinchas and Hofni, and they, they were like we discussed before, Eli simply potentially did not have time to raise them properly. Yeah. And uh, what was their practice? This was the practice of the Kohanim with the people. When any person would slaughter a sacrifice, the coin's attendant would come while the meat was cooking yeah. with a three-pronged fork in the hand. Right. They actually instituted their practice. I believe if I read before that it used to be either one prong or two prongs but they made it three prongs really? so they can poke as much meat as possible get it, uh... and get more meat. So they were greedy. <laughs> you would thrust it into the pot it's or the it. cauldron or the pan or the kettle yeah. and everything the fork would bring up, the coin would take with it. Yeah. This is what they would do with all the Israel Israelites who would come there to shield. Yes. Even before they would burn the fat upon the altar, the coin's attendant would come and say to the man who was bringing the offering, the the meat, but for the coin. he will not take cooked meat from you, but only <laughs> another thing that they changed was they would take the meat before it was put on the altar. The man would say, let them first, so the first time people did not protest again. Yeah, we are one because they didn't, want to, they didn't want to look greedy. Hold on one second. I'm going to. They did not want to look greedy. Uh, if they would have said, Why are you doing the three prongs? That means like you're taking away some of the portion that's going to come back to me. They didn't want to sound like uh, they wanted some meat back. They were coming to God and they wanted to give as much as possible. But now something changing. They're also starting to take the. the the meat before it even hits the altar. So now they get really upset with them. The men would say, let them first burn the fat upon the altar and then take for yourself whatever your soul desires. But the attendant would say, no, give it now or else I will take it by force. So these attendants were influenced by the two sons of Eli. And it goes to show how much influence we have on others by negative behavior. Uh, we should always know that our bad deeds are not exclusive to ourselves. People learn from us. Anybody underneath us, attendants, children, subordinates, they learn by our behavior. Even animals, like we witnessed in the generation before the flood, followed the way of the people. Mm -hmm. So the sin of the attendants was very great before wow. Hashem, for the man had disgraced Hashem's offering. It was a complete Hilul Hashem. I think, they, they I think really we're going to pause here. There's much more, and I don't want to rush it. I think these guys coined the phrase, fork it over. Fork it over, nice. Exactly. So anyways, thank you for joining. God willing, next week we'll Yay. continue. It gets really, really interesting.
as uh, what they did and 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 Shmu what how Shmuel is going to rise to greatness. Anyways, have a good evening. Very nice. Nice trying. I like it. See you later. Thank you.